Well, after this insightful session, we'll quickly move on to another spectacular session on innovation, gen AI and human alchemy, a fusion of bites and beings. Yes, and our speaker for this session is none other than the very dynamic Mr. Sanat Rao, CEO, Infosys Finekel. Let's clap hands and let's welcome him here on stage, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Sanat Rao, welcome, sir. Okay, thanks everyone, and sorry for that short glitch. Um, I know there's a choice of sessions going on parallelly, so thank you for choosing to come here. Uh, there is obviously an esteemed panel immediately after mine to talk about the same topic in more detail, but I was asked to give a high-level perspective of the fusion between Gen AI and human beings, and I'm here to talk to you about that. Um, the reason I've put this is that I'm about six weeks away from moving away from a corporate life after 34 years to becoming a first-time entrepreneur just short of the age of 60. Uh, and the AI bug has... <laughs> we are calling ourselves within the box.ai and I'll talk about it right at the end of the session. Uh, what I want to do in the next 15 minutes, given that there is a panel coming up immediately after this, who will obviously discuss this in more detail, is to give you a multidisciplinary perspective of what this fusion actually means. And I think sometimes we tend to overlook the fact that the fusion between technologies like AI and all of us as human beings is actually far more intricate than we acknowledge. During the course of the session, though the topic heading is Gen AI, I will obviously use that interchangeably with Gen AI and AI, so don't necessarily see it only in the context of LLMs and Gen AI. It's seen a little more broadly as AI itself. The truth is that we all know Gen AI is here, right? And whether it is the usage of the many different LLMs that are coming, the debate that's going on about whether LLMs should be open sourced or, uh, or not, uh, the fact that uh, it's not just the large tech companies who are behind the LLMs. Today there are uh, LLMs being propagated by individual institutions. So a lot of activity is happening in this space. And this is just the start. Like it always happens in your technology, there's a lot that's gonna happen in the coming years and therefore, sometimes the expectations that get raised in the short term with something new and excitable, I think we have to temper that, recognizing that it's gonna take a bit of time before this maturity happens. Just as the technology has excited us, there's equal amount of attention being paid to the gaffes that are happening. And this is gonna happen, this is gonna to continue to happen. Uh, there are many, many you know, examples of these. Uh, what we have on the slide here are only a handful of them. But these are not going to stop. In fact, I make a point later in this presentation that hallucinations of LLMs are actually a feature. They're not a bug. You need to recognize them as a feature of LLMs and take that in your stride and understand how you deal with that rather than saying it's a bug and it's going to disappear in six months because the technology is going to mature. right? So what's happening right now is a feature of the kind of technology we're using. And as, as the technology matures, we're going to keep finding this happening. But obviously, there'll be other very exciting developments that will happen, which will allow us to leverage it much better. When the topic was given to me saying, talk about alchemy. Now, those of you who know the genesis of the word alchemy, if you go back to the annals of time, Alchemy talked about the transformation from what was seen as something very mundane into the very magnificent. You bring that to modern era, and today, you know, those of you who were in Ramesh's session in track one just a short while ago, he talked about how HDFC Bank is today focusing a lot on using their own data and making that into actionable insights, right? And as we know from our respective organizations, whether you're a large bank, whether you're a telecom company, or even you're a small fintech, the data that you have at your fingertips is probably the most valuable source of information you're ever going to have, 
right? And that is what this alchemy needs to be seen in the context of. The alchemy is seen to be in the context of the ability to be able to leverage some of these tools that you have at your fingertips with the capability of technology. But as I'm going to argue in this presentation, it's important to look not just at the technological side of it, it's important to look at the social sciences and the human behavioral side of it, because that's where the real excitement starts happening. When you look at the way technology particularly, but the more powerful technology specifically is used, and you look at the examples of Netflix, you look at the examples of Amazon, all of us have sort of submitted to the way they have engulfed our life. Right? Many times when recommendations come for something that we want to watch on Netflix, research has shown that if I as an individual am asked what do I want to see, I'll have a less specific answer than the algorithm which has made it very, very specific by the kind of options that come up on the screen when I'm on Netflix, Netflix page. What does this say? It says that the technology actually knows a little more about you, more specifically than probably you know yourself. And that is what I think is happening as Gen AI starts engulfing us, uh, you know, AI generally starts engulfing ourselves. Um, uh, into into this uh, into this uh, uh, the way of working, and I think we're going to find that as this technology matures, there are going to be more and more examples of the way we may not necessarily have an answer to the way the technology has been made available to us, but when you look beyond the technology and the options itself, you'll find that there's a pattern emerging, and the pattern is all about our own behavior. Too often today, the focus is on the technology side of it not enough intention is being given to the behavioral side of the human being who ultimately is responsible for making the technology behave the way we want it to behave. A few years ago, I um, embarked on a journey in academia. It was during COVID and there's an emerging social science called digital anthropology. Uh, as the name suggests, it's digital and it's anthropology. I'd never heard the two used in conjunction. Essentially what this new social sciences talks about is it understands what human behavior is like as all of us as individuals are engulfed by digital technologies. A lot of time we pay attention to the fact that, you know, facial recognition systems, for example, are seen as controversial, right? Um, um, uh, a lot of the biometrics, if you look at the way Aadhaar is seen overseas, for people who have not understood Aadhaar, the attention is not on the benefits of Aadhaar and the Nienda stack, it's about how the usage of biometrics and the way it has got implemented is seen to be possibly an invasion of individuals' privacy. And as some of these technologies become more, um, um, you know, become more um, powerful, governments, security agencies will need to find that right balance in being able to, on the one hand, use it for security and our well-being, but at the same time trying to understand how does it sort of not impede upon our civil liberties as individuals and as, you know, human beings. Now, there's no right answer for that. If you look at this question very carefully, there's no right answer for that. A lot of it varies by culture, a lot of it varies by context, a lot of this varies by situation. And the truth is that as, as, as these examples happen, particularly where it gets used in a rogue situation where people will misuse the technology, a lot of attention will get paid to the fact that the technology has been wrongly used, but that's a feature and the function of what the technology makes available in your, in your, you know, in your hands. Any technology today can be used for good and it can be used for bad. Right? And I think what, what a lot of the social sciences and the behavioral sciences are now saying is that as we understand that these technologies have the good and they have the very bad, it's important to look at it from a behavioral sciences point of view and to look at the societal impact of that before we pass judgment on the technology itself. Uh, I made the point here about, you know, taking an anthropological view. Uh, there's a lot of literature in recent times about the way AI can and has been helping us to preserve our cultural heritage. For example, there are studies that are being shown today that 
you know, all of you will be familiar about the migration of people from North Africa into Europe. It's become a very, very big issue, right? In, in France, in Italy, in the UK. There's large-scale migration happening. A lot of it is obviously is illegal migration. AI technologies are trying to, today, help us understand what are the patterns in these migrations? Why is this happening? But more importantly, when these people land on the shores of the new country, right? And they land, obviously, in traumatic circumstances, you can't turn them away. Many of them have come because of, you know, uh, very, very unfortunate personal situations. And today, the border control is trying to understand ways in which the AI can be used to be able to deal with illegal migration in a manner which, on the one hand, enforces the jurisdiction and enforces the guidelines of that particular country, because every country, obviously, is legitimately right to have its border control uh, policies. But at the same time, there is this belief that's coming, saying that the powerful technology can actually make it easier for you to deal with a difficult situation in a more humane manner. And today there are very interesting studies being done, particularly in uh, border Europe, uh, where you know, there's a lot of migration happening um, from North Africa. And that gives a lot of insight into um, how the enmeshing of these cultures is happening and how that can be actually studied through AI technology. Probably the most interesting part of the discussion right now is on the ethical terrain in AI. Um, I live in the UK, and in the UK and Europe, it's all about the EU AI Act that's going to come in later this year. And I think exactly like it happened in GDPR as far as privacy was concerned, I dare say that once the EU AI Act uh, you know, is sort of passed into law, there'll be a lot of different avatars of that in different parts of the world. You know, exactly like GDPR led to many different avatars in different parts of the world, the same is expected of the EU AI Act. What is inarguable is that today there is an acknowledgement that while you want to have laws and regulation on the one hand, laws and regulation can protect you in certain situations. But even without laws and regulation, I think proponents of creating more ethically oriented systems are saying that at the point of development of the AI technology, whether it's the many fintechs who are you know, using AI or whether it's a it's a, it's a user or consumer of AI. If you were to pay attention to the ethical dimensions of that at the point of development and consumption, you don't necessarily need the powerful laws and regulation. What does the law and regulation do? The law and regulation allows you to draw a line where something starts to go wrong. Right? But you don't necessarily have to wait for things to go wrong to point to the law. If you acknowledge that there is a right way of doing things, a lot of the problems, 80% of the problems, can be addressed at the point of development. So today there's a lot of attention being paid on the ethical terrain, and I dare say for all of us who use or who are you know, uh, users of AI in some way or the other, we'll find that one of the big changes as EU AI Act and subsequent acts come into, um, uh, come into the picture is going to be the attention on the ethical terrain of AI itself. And I'm sure while there'll be, you know, the, while there'll be a cultural variance of this, because what uh, what gets manifested into our behavior and our usage, let's say, in India, is going to be very different from, let's say, what happens in Dubai, or it's going to be very different to what happens in Europe, simply because our perspective of aspects of our behavior, and ethics is obviously one dimension of behavior, is not necessarily the same. So there's no one single you know, uh, answer to uh, what is ethically right or wrong, and you see that even in privacy. The US's approach to privacy is a very, very consumer-driven approach. We've all used the word privacy now for many, many years, right? It's not something new. And yet, even today, after all these years and after all the changes that have happened in technology, there's a very, very fundamental difference in the way the US looks at privacy versus the way Europe looks at privacy. And that's exactly what's going to happen in, uh, in, on the ethical side of uh, AI. Why do I put this at the forefront? Because while the ethics is expected to make things more clear, Believe you me, it's going to make things more complicated as well. Because when we start imbibing some ethical principles at the point of development, there is going to be no one, you know, there's going to be no one-size-fits-all approach. It is going to be based a lot on the beliefs, it's going to be based on cultural situations, it's going to be based on heritage, and that's, what, that's, that's going to sort of muddy the waters. And as it has hop happened in many new technologies, it's going to go through waves, it's going to go through some mishaps, it's going to go through some questionable situations before things start settling down. 
in UK and Europe, where obviously because we are in the middle of the, the impending um, um, uh, uh, you know, announcement of the EUA Act, there's a lot of attention being given to the fact that even as the Act comes in later this year, things are not going to be hunky-dory on day one. Some things will be overlooked, some things will be neglected, some things will be wrongly dealt with. We have to allow time for it to mature. But hopefully, the fact that the regulation on the one hand, the fact that the recognition of the ethical dimension on the other is at least being talked about now, which was not being done even as recently as two, three years ago, will start putting the you know, uh, attention on the right matters. I don't know how many of us have a clear understanding of the impact of AI on human psychology. And not to sound very dramatic, but I'm going to give you two examples, which are probably two very extremes, but both are being used today. An emerging area of development in AI is what is commonly being used as social AI. If you look at a country like Japan, for example, AI and humanoids are being seen as a very, very important tool to challenge and to address one of the biggest issues in the Japanese society, which is companionship. Right? Companionship in Japan has become a major, major issue. It is leading to isolation, it's leading to mental issues, it's leading to marital rift, and people are turning to technology, and people are turning to robots as companions, and the whole element of social AI, not as a fact that an individual has a robot as a partner, but the fact that it can actually have a materially beneficial impact for the individual is now being studied very closely in the social sciences. In fact, if you've, if you've read about it, it's not just about companionship. Because Japan is an aging population, and because, as you see, you know, cities like Tokyo have led to a lot of isolationism, it's led to a lot of pressure, it's a very expensive uh, city. Um, it's had its own challenges as far as the, you know, the fabric of the uh, culture and society is concerned. And as you know, Japan is a country which has huge respect for culture and tradition. Today, they are consciously making a big leap, which is a big change for a, which, for a country like Japan, which has always been technologically advanced, of using robots and humanoids even for sex. It is not being, you know, it's not being looked at in the wrong manner, but it's being seen as an inevitable change with the power of technology as a, as, as a, as a tool to be able to address a very, very fundamental problem that's existing in the local society. So you have that one element, which is called social AI. And today, I think, while we are still at a very early stage of social AI, you'll find that in the next three to five years, and particularly in populations which are aging, you know, not so much in India because we've got a very young population, but you'll find that in aging populations and in populations where there are lots of divorces, where there are marital rifts and so on, social AI is going to be one of the very, very big areas of development. And it's going to be seen as an area which can actually try and solve a lot of the community-based problems which today are being overlooked, uh, either because we choose to sort of neglect it or because there's no technological answer to that. Right? So that's one hand. On the other hand is, uh, you know, uh, how AI is being used, uh, and, you know, IBM Watson is one example for that, how it's being used for prescriptions and to be able to determine the right kind of medical treatment for people. Or if you look at the whole um, evolution of wearable technology today, right? Wearable technology is progressing very fast. It's no longer wearable on the outside. Now wearable technology has gone under the skin. Uh, it's gone to the different parts of the body. And wearable technology is rapidly progressing as a tool to be able to help our well-being, right? So you've got these two extreme kind of examples. On the one hand, wearable technology to, for the benefit. On the other hand, social AI to address an issue like isolationism and you know, uh, uh, mental uh, well-being, both of these are impinging very, very strongly on the psychology of human beings. Now, this is already happening. It's not futuristic. This is already happening. And that is why when you look at a topic says that you know, AI and human alchemy, what could be more fundamental than an individual choosing to have a robot or a humanoid as a companion or a partner rather than another human being. It's a very, very fundamental shift. It's probably not got discussed in many communities because it's not yet an issue. Certainly in India, it's not yet an issue. 
And maybe when it becomes an issue here in another 30, 40 years, when India becomes a much older population, uh, there may be cultural issues here, just like Japan has had to deal with that. But psychologically today, there are examples of this, of what I just told you, of how this is creeping into the human psychology in certain communities and certain parts of the world. And we're going to see more and more such examples as we go forward. I think on the economic and political side, um, a lot has been said in the interest of time. I won't sort of, uh, you know, dwell on this. Uh, you know, what is commonly focused upon is, you know, automation, job losses, and so on. I mean, that's, that's obviously said. Um, fortunately, there's enough of an alternate view today saying that while some kinds of tasks and jobs may be lost, Clearly, there are going to be, you know, a lot of other opportunities that are going to come up. So it's not just going to be job losses. Maybe there are other, other benefits that are going to come in. What is probably, you know, when you, when you look at human alchemy and, sorry, when you look at the alchemy of human beings and uh, AI kind of technologies, there's, there's, there's one other sort of larger impact, larger benefit, larger um, uh, issue which can have a material impact on all of us, not, not you and I as individuals, but it, as far as the community is concerned, which is this whole issue that today, the fight between the US and China is actually a fight for AI dominance. It's not about whether China wants Taiwan, it's not about the US interfering in the Middle East, it's not about US supporting Israel. All of those are examples and they have political and historical, uh, you know, maybe explanations to that. But the real battle between the two countries is the battle for AI dominance. And why is that important to acknowledge? Moment one of them starts using it for political domination, it is going to infiltrate into, into the military and into the army. When that happens, the scale of the possible wrong usage of that increases manifold. It has not yet happened today, therefore it's not probably discussed as frequently as it ought to be done. But in that battle that's happening between the US and, uh, and China, and the battle is not so much about military might, it's the battle for AI political, uh, sorry, AI domination. You're gonna find that as, 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 as development happens in that space, there'll be a lot more impact as far as the economic and political uh, climate is concerned. Uh, I've already referred to many aspects of um, how it's going to impact culture. Um, I think here in India itself, we're going to see, uh, you know, many different dimensions of that, given that in a country like India, there are so many different cultural manifestations in different parts of the country. Um, suffice to say that today, you know, when a Dal E produces art or an Iowa produces music, right, there are people who say that that's only a natural development. It doesn't necessarily impinge on a genuine artist or a genuine musician. There are others who say that's the wrong thing to do. When there are artists and musicians who are wanting to perform today, you can't have a piece of technology produce art and music. Right? So it's already sort of divided uh, the world on two extreme fronts, and I think you're going to see more and more of that. But there are going to be many different examples of how it's going to come and start shaping our culture. I gave you examples earlier about how it's being used at the border. I gave you examples of how it's being used in Japan to combat, uh, you know, isolationism. Um, uh, even in terms of facial recognition and technologies for, um, you know, for, um, for security purposes. Um, how we deal with that and the way we, the way we accept some of those, um, uh, you know, uh, situations of deployment have a lot to do with our culture and our acceptance of some of these technologies coming into our day to day. So I think we're going to see a lot more examples of that. Today, probably most literature and most experts in the field say that it's time to move beyond looking at job losses because while there will be obviously impact of some areas with, the, with, the, with this technology become more, becoming more strong, there's obviously a, you know, a strong enough belief that there'll be a lot of positive benefits also that will come out of this uh, out of this technology, and uh, you know whether you succumb to that viewpoint because there's no choice, or whether you succumb to that viewpoint because you genuinely believe that AI will have a much better impact in the future, and there's a, there's a large political sorry, a large positive side to it, even as though there, even as there're going to be some negative points, it is going to have a very big material impact, and you know. 
when you hear about the very, very large community-based issues, whether it's ESG, whether it's healthcare, uh, if AI can go a long way in helping us in addressing some of those very, very big issues like that, it'll obviously, you know, in the, in, in the arguments of many people, it'll, it'll lead to, I think, a greater acknowledgement that while there'll be areas where it'll have a negative impact, this will have a much, you know, it'll sort of override in terms of the positive impact that it'll have in some of these areas. I just want to end with uh, a couple of points, and this sort of resonates with, I think, a point that Ramesh was making in the previous session that uh, just got over in track one. LLMs will keep coming along, right? Um, ChatGPT, today you've already got Claude from Anthropic, you've got Facebook with their version, you've got, you know, Bloomberg has come out with their um, um, uh, LLM. Um, very recently, JP Morgan was the first financial institution to announce that they're going to come out with their LLM for, for banking. So you're going to have a lot more of these coming along. Many of them are going to be perishable. They are not necessarily going to last. They'll undergo a change. They'll come up with many different avatars of that. What is going to remain sacrosanct is the organizational data. That is what is there in your control. That is what is residing in your systems. That is the one in which you can play around with. You have legitimacy over it. And how you use the LLM is only a tool. The true strength of that is going to come from the data. It's not going to come from the LLM. So that's point number one. Point number two, as I said earlier, is hallucinations are features and not really a bug. And I think that point fits in well with this argument about the fact that in a human AI alchemy, it's not about the AI replacing the human being, it's about what role the human being should be able to play to augment the availability of a technology like AI. So if you take, if you take hallucinations of an LLM in your stride and you acknowledge that while the LLM and the quer queries that you post to a chat GPT, for example, may have a lot of accuracy around many things that it throws, you're bound to have the errors, you're bound to have the hallucinations, you're bound to have the wrong information being thrown back. If you, if you acknowledge that, then you'll never totally submit to it. Right? You'll never sort of take that and say, okay, this is the answer and I'm just going to you know, use it as it is. You'll, you, you'll, you'll be forced to sort of acknowledge that you as an individual have to pay attention to it, you have to look at it, you have to analyze it, and then you have to decide how you want to use it. Or indeed, whether you want to use all of it. Right? You may choose eventually not to use all of it which is where the human judgment comes in. I think that fits in very well with the argument that's being made that AI is not going to replace human beings. You're going to be replaced by, not by the AI, but you're going to be replaced by a human being who knows how to use AI. You're vulnerable to the person next to you who knows how to use AI better than the technology itself. Right? And I think that is what uh, this, this point about hallucinations are features rather than bugs of LLMs is sort of pointing to. One last slide about what I'm going to be doing. Uh, after 34 years in industry, we are, from April, setting up an AI advisory, uh, research and design agency, uh, based out of the UK, but um, you know, soon in UAE, India, and Amsterdam. The business model we've taken is a very, very interesting, and we hope it's going to be a very different business model. What we've got on the one hand is a multidisciplinary team. So in our team, we've got bankers, software people, data scientists, anthropologists, sociologists, because I and my co-founder strongly believe that if you don't take the social sciences into the realm of things, you don't use social sciences in the right manner, and you look at it only as a technology, then you're probably missing, the, uh, you know, missing a trick there. But the real change in the approach we're taking is that we've got some very leading professors from Oxford, Cambridge, London School of Economics, and a handful of other leading universities to be part of our panel. Now, many of these, as you know, are at cutting edge of research. Right? They're doing a lot of cutting edge research, either for big companies or because universities like Oxford and Cambridge are very well funded, and therefore they're doing a lot of research which you and I as individuals will never get access to. So the whole model of our advisory is to create advisory on the back of research that's happening in these leading universities, and it's going to be led not just by industry practitioners like bankers and software people and big four consultants, but we're going to have professors, research associates, PhDs from these universities to be a part of the offering. 
and hopefully that will make a very big difference to the way you know to the way we uh, we bring a certain value to clients. Uh, we launch in April 24, and hopefully we'll be able to do some good business in India as well. Uh, like I said, this was a very, very quick run through. There's a panel now to discuss the same thing, and I'm sure they'll get into a lot more detail about some of this as far as the alchemy between human beings on the one hand and AI technologies on the other hand is concerned. Thank you for your attention.